Welcome back. This is episode 22, I believe, and I now have fiber optics, so there's not going to be any buffering. My stream health looks excellent. It says it is healthy, so thank you, everybody, that has stuck around for some of the ups and downs. Yeah, I still got some stuff going on in the background before I get the production completely back to 100%, but... I want to introduce our incredible panel. As always, we've got Coach Rob Beams. Morning, guys. He is the man. And then we also have Shane. Is it Harlow? Harlow? Harlow. 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 He is an up-and-coming content creator. And this channel is all about just building everybody up. So if you make a channel and you're adding to the growth of the sport, well, we want to honor you and you know, everyone has a voice here because at the end of the day, I'm just some SOB in front of a camera. So why not uh, help other people grow? Right. You know, you, you give back a little bit. Yes. Eventually we'll talk to more writers and things of that nature. But for now, every so often, I think it's important to uh, help everyone like the whole rising tide deal. And today we are going to talk about pro circuit, basically becoming itself again if we want to say that because it's been freaking i want to say like five ten years maybe even when josh hansen was still racing for him that those guys were or ac when they were a powerhouse we're going to talk about some factory parts we're going to talk about the triple crowns uh potentially getting yourself pumped on the starting line whether you're doing you know pneumonia ammonia it's not pneumonia it's ammonia right <laughs> pneumonia is the sickness we don't want that <laughs> and um uh, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about jet too, just because that dude is, I, I don't know. He's just on a completely another level, but here, Shane, uh, tell us a little bit about yourself. All right. So with me, you know, I'm, like you said, I'm starting to try to create a media platform. So I've been a long time moto follower. I have some pretty deep moto roots, but I'm actually myself a BMX racer. So, um, you know, moto is really cool. It's like our sport because BMX isn't nearly as big where it has like a national TV broadcast that we could all go and watch on the weekend. But anyways, um, been following the sport for years and I've been a amateur photographer. You know, that's one of my passions. So I would always go to the races and try to get some good pictures or whatever, but never really like tried to take it anywhere. Um, so as I saw the the way that the sport was progressing and things were going this year, I was like, you know what, this is the year that I think I need to start documenting what's going on and just put my voice out there. Cause I feel like this is going to be a, a pretty cool year. You know, things are happening and I don't know if we're going to see another year like this, you know, say if Tomac retires and things start changing and all this stuff, we might not have another season like this for a while. So for one, I just wanted to start, broadcasting it so i could always look at, back at my own content down the road and be like man that was a cool time and then i just thought it was a good time to launch my own media platform because it's something that i do have a passion for so like i enjoy creating videos and editing videos you know from when i was racing bmx or not that i don't race bmx anymore but just in general i like to you know create videos that way so it kind of just transitioned naturally my photography and my video creating passion just kind of flowed right into moto because i'm also passionate about that so it all just kind of interlocked and it's been a pretty easy process so far so just been enjoying it heck yeah heck yeah and his link is in the description so better way to support than to hit that subscribe button right guys so anyway first and foremost uh it's a pleasure having you on here shane and if you have any questions dude uh again we're we're friends now uh so you know, hit me a message or something and I, I can try to help you as, uh, is it Mark Twain? The best experience is not your own. So I've made lots of mistakes in this <laughs> whole content creation thing by being incredibly negative and uh, somewhat attacking the sport, but it was really attacking myself. Just people took it the wrong way. And now I'm still trying to dig myself out of the freaking hole because, uh, I got a weird stigma. You know, when I when I meet new sponsors or or things of that nature, they're like, "Oh, Johnny Hopper, we can't we can't help him." And I'm like, "Guys, come on, you know who fucking cares at this point? Like, <laughs> grow up, right? Uh, we all go through shit, and that's that's the thing." So anyway, that is a good segue to this whole Star Yamaha transition. It it kind of seems I I don't want to 
paint a picture, but here I'll, I'll, I'll try to be a Van Gogh. As soon as Deegan joined star on the two fifties, it seemed like everyone wanted to leave and the other teams are doing better. Maybe besides Joe Shimoto on the Honda. What do you think coach? Well, I think it goes without saying you said it earlier, you know, I uh, don't think PC's had a win since uh, AC himself. And then if you look at the success that stars had, yeah, it's, uh, it's pretty hard to argue with it. I think, and I'm going to give Levi kitchen a ton of props. Correct me if I'm wrong guys, but I believe he's the first person that actually left star on his own. I was, I was thinking about this over the weekend, Johnny. I don't know of anybody who's left star um, and gone to another team, much less go to PC, which when he, when he made that move, PC was starting to show that their bikes were competitive, but I don't think we saw it. We didn't foresee this coming. So I, I think it's pretty amazing. And I think PC has earned every, every bit of clawing back to the top, considering they're, they're leading both, both, both coasts. And, uh, the idea that had Forkner got hurt, we would even had another guy that's up there every single weekend. So yeah, props Wait, to PC. Coach, are, are, are you inferring that most of the riders that have left um, star have been kind of like contract end rather than Levi actually going, you know what? Um, you want me to ride here, but I don't want to ride here anymore. I'm going to go somewhere else. Yeah. I mean, based on what we know, both behind the scenes and publicly, he had an he was offered to stay at star but chose to go to pc now there's some discussion points a lot of those guys are riding for bonuses only and i don't think anybody would be surprised when you have the opportunity to ride a star bike with win bonuses um gosh i'm drawing a mental blank here thrasher right he either wins or gets 15th and those win bonuses are good enough that if you hit one or two of those a year you're making pretty good money so I don't know that anybody that has left the team left because they were offered another opportunity at another team. Uh, you know what I'm saying? It's like, well, if you're getting let go by star and then somebody else wants to hire you, great. But Levi Kitchen was very vocal about the idea. He had a contract to stay, chose to go to PC when they offered it up. And uh, I don't know. There's, I got a little bit of um, some hate DMs and we made the comment that um, – Star Yamaha has a trademark on that motor and that that trademark has come up this year. And it's kind of interesting how all of a sudden now the, as you say, the tides are rising all boats. It's uh, it's interesting how that horsepower gap seems to have been minimized. I still go back to the example of Jeremy Martin chasing Jay Coop. Um, and, you know, Jeremy's on that Geico Honda just going everywhere he can wide open and just literally getting dropped. And you can see just the sheer horsepower. We don't see that now. We're seeing more and more PC bikes actually be the first ones into the first turn. So big, big shift. And I think we have to give props. This is one of the things I love about human performance is it's always easy to look at when somebody gets back to the top or ever gets to the top in the first place. But to get to the top and then essentially lose that stronghold and then to fight your way back, we have no idea of all the small nuances that have been in place for the last three to four years, while while Mitch is trying to figure that whole bike out, it was not, you know was, uh, Shimoda was very vocal. He was afraid of the bike, got hurt by the bike. A um, couple of the riders at PC were pretty vocal about the bike's scary thing to ride. Now I think people are gravitating towards, hey, I want to ride that bike, kind of like what we saw with Star Yamaha. So interesting paradigm shift, but man, the amount of sweat equity that went into making this a reality is is got to be unbelievable. Yeah, no, because what's what's the saying that it's hard to teach an old dog new tricks? And yeah. when you are the shit for so long, it's hard to try to change things because, um, again, I, I believe the sport is resistant to change. That's why, like, even on my last news show, I was talking about Yamaha coming out with a prototype Yamaha and that's electric. And everybody is just, they're so, so against it. And, and I understand. I understand, right? Like, but there was a time when everyone was against four strokes. And it's not really up to us consumers. It's what the marketing teams and the big corporations, what they decide to, to throw at us, you know, that if we want to still ride and if they flood the market with e-bikes because it's a, a better profit margin, well, then we're all going to end up riding e-bikes. We don't really have a choice. Yeah, we can, as consumers, make the choice to not buy that product um, to support that. But if it's the only one there, you know, it's like the whole Apple uh, iPhone right now. Apple is being sued. 
um, by the government because it has a strong arm. You know, it's a monopoly. It's not allowing other smartphone creators to build and innovate, right? Because they pretty much own the entire market share minus left over with Android. But I am digressing. My point is here is people used to go to pro circuit as this was my shot. And if you couldn't make it at pro circuit, well, then your career ended there. Nobody else wanted you. But now it almost seems like people are going to pro circuit to rejuvenize their careers, which I find incredibly interesting. Shane, what are your thoughts on the whole star Yamaha versus uh, PC? So my thoughts are kind of the same as, as what you're saying. So you could look at Enzo Lopes and his situation where he obviously ditched the club MX ride at the last minute to go to the star team. And that was kind of the thing that people were saying was, well, if he can't make it on the star, then his career might be over. So it's kind of like the pro circuit back in the day where it's like, well, that's the best bike. So if you can't do it on that bike, then, oh, well, you're not, you're just not good enough. So I do think there was a shift there as far as Yamaha or star Yamaha specifically took over that, that, you know, mindset of people thinking they're the top team. But I do also think that at the end of last year, especially in the SMX playoffs, you did see where Pro Circuit was starting to turn that corner. Like you said, with the engine power, there wasn't such a big gap in, you know, the performance of the motorcycles. So now we're starting to see that come to fruition, especially with, um, with, uh, <clears throat> what is his name? <laughs> Bobby Reagan. Later on the on the, I don't know why I can't think. Um, That's all right. Just just throw numbers out and we can try to help you, dude. It's it's uh, okay, guys. This is live, and <laughs> if we're gonna make anybody feel like an idiot, make me because, dude, we all know I've done some silly stuff on the live show. Um, so so Levi, Levi switched over to um, Pro Circuit, right? And that yes. was like so he ditched the Yamaha, he went to Pro Circuit, and now we're seeing that where. Yes, he was he was a race winner and contender, but now he's looking like a true champion, which you could argue that, you know, part of that is maybe he's just getting better as a racer. But also, I think a lot of that is the equipment. And, you know, a lot of it could just be, like you said, he wanted to leave Yamaha to get away from the digging fanfare and all that. So maybe that was a mental thing that he needed to go to the next level. And maybe he didn't want to train at the farm. You know, maybe that was too much. It wasn't for him, whatever the case. But now you start to see the shift of pro circuit. They have the depth because you could argue McAdoo, he's looking like he could potentially win the East coast, but if he wasn't going to win, it could have been Forkner, obviously if things were different. And now on the other side, you got Levi and he's looking really good and he's beating the two veterans of the sport that have been doing the 250 coast races for years and years. So yeah, I think it's starting to shift. I mean, obviously they have Deegan and he's, got a lot of potential but he's literally racing the pro circuit teams right now and losing to him so johnny something else to think about remember when people were blown away how big mitch's team was he was the only 250 team that had four riders regularly then you saw geico kind of started to follow that and then you have star that comes in and just engulfs everybody you know they they have what eight nine ten riders i mean as as recent as adding michael moseman it's it to me, it's very interesting because it if you look at kind of from 10,000 foot, look at the Pierre Mobility Group, it's pretty hard not to get a 450 championship when you at the time had, you know, Webb and Dunge and Osborne and Muscan. And, you know, if you're just playing the, the role of the odds, if you've got six of the 10 top guys, it, that's I'm not saying that they're buying their championships at all. They're each one of those teams are earning it. But it's interesting on the business model, because I remember when Star Yamaha, I was working with Nico Izzy at the time. And he was riding for Star, and I remember being in their 18 wheeler at Daytona, and we were at, we were talking about the race and the track and the setup and stuff. That wasn't that long ago, um, and so you look at how Star Yamaha goes from a small team, kind of like JGR, you know, second tier satellite team, start growing their numbers, numbers start creating results just out of sheer statistics. Next thing you know, they start steamrolling some momentum, start getting more support, they get appointed the the factory Yamaha 250 program, and the rest is history. But kind of continuing on what we said about last week, you know, if the buyout of Star Yamaha, say that it again. He, you're, you're good, coach. You're good. I'm um, in the background getting ready for our next topic. And so I, <laughs> I had the, the, the volume. I need a production crew <laughs> to help with this stuff. 
Um, well, just what man, we were talking about last week with if Star Yamaha gets bought out, we're hearing it's going to be a two man 250 team, a two man 450 team. So it leaves a lot of people unemployed. So uh, it's like you saw the teams grow, grow, grow. Now you see them downsize, downsize, and yet you have PCs had a four man team all the way through. It's it's kind of interesting the difference of and the approach. And now you look at the Pierre Mobility Group. You know they don't have that stable of of horses like they used to have when you think about what used to be out there at the baker's factory osborne muscan dunge um well i mean it's just so many guys for the viewers that don't know is the pure mobility group sort of the baker's factory and everything that it encompasses well pure the pure mobility group would just be ktm husqvarna gas gas and so when you think about when they were winning every year they were getting the championship osborne um dunge that you know they they pretty much were stamping it but again if you're smart enough and you can build the team big enough the odds start to work for you and you had such incredible talent underneath that umbrella and the fact that people were kind of shying away from pc because the bikes weren't fast the bikes you know they, it was interesting how the bikes went from not being fast to not being reliable now they're both fast and reliable and now that's the team to be back at it against so it's, it's it's a tough one. This industry is a tough one to keep up with for sure. From can you imagine from a rider standpoint, Johnny, if you had a 16 year old son that's you know like the Max Volan type of talent, where would you want him to go? Three years ago, it'd be Star Yamaha. You know, Brian Deegan talked about that. They went out and rode all the bikes and said, "What's the best bike for Deegan's future?" They went with Star. Besides yeah. the fact that Brian's an investor and all that, but still, it could have gone anywhere they wanted to. Coach, what? Okay, this is this might be some really shitty advice. So, you know, disclaimer, right? <laughs> um, but again, back to experience is best when it's not your own. Careers are so short in this business <clears throat> to the point where loyalty shouldn't really matter. I know that sounds awful, but if you have a good opportunity with like a star Yamaha and you are an Enzo Lopes, that's why I somewhat respect Enzo for, for, you know, kicking club to the curb. I'm sure it didn't go as smoothly, but you're only as good as your last race. So if you can perform the best with the best equipment, that's what you should do. Just like if you're a local guy and you're getting suspension for free from the local guy, but you're trying to get on the national circuit or the arena cross circuit or whatever, you may need to have another opportunity to get some better equipment. You know, this is just um, an example here to where, yeah, you might piss off some people, but it's really, you're only as good as your last race. You need to take the opportunities that arise to you. So if star Yamaha doesn't become the one all be all right now, then yeah, Levi needs to leave and move over there because what have I talked about in the past? I've talked about factory parts where there's only so much money to go around and therefore teams prioritize who they give their stuff to. Like right now, the perfect example is the progressive twisted T Suzuki here. You've got Shane McElrath who shouldn't be 15 places behind Kenny just shouldn't be as far as talent wise. You're talking about a 250 champion here. So for him, he's got, lackluster equipment compared to Kenny. Uh, that's my speculation. And we've got uh, Davey Millsaps once again saying so or saying as much on the last Gypsy Tale podcast here. Okay. So then, I, then James wasn't doing very good. I was beating him. I was, you know, what was I? Podium, you know, in the top three in points, whatever it was. And then James left. And then I got James bike. Mm. And then I started podium a lot. Was it way better? Way better. Really? Way, way, Why way better. Fuck? Like if you can Don't build know. one, just build two. Nope. Too expensive to build two. That's so I got, I got the That's sh absolutely. I got the sh so my point with that is, do you guys believe that? And <laughs> do you think that's potentially the paradigm shift at star is Deegan comes in and with all of his clout and everything is like, Hey, this is what I need. And so other writers like Levi Kitchen and them aren't getting as good of, I guess, maybe even support. It could just be even mechanics. It might not even have to be parts. So you leave. It's the same reason as to why I sincerely believe Chase Sexton went with a lackluster 
potential team just because of the opportunity with KTM, right? You had Webb leaving KTM for obvious reasons because they didn't like where the bike was going. And Honda, why didn't Sexton stay with Honda? Well, you had two other guys that were potentially taking the clout from him. So he needed to do what was best for him, not necessarily the brand loyalty. Well, I'm going to give Shane a chance to talk, but the first thing I want to say is to validate your point, it's happening right now. Cooper Webb didn't like the bike. Chase Sexton didn't like the bike. Chase Sexton wants it changed. Chase Sexton's now got KYB internals on his WP forks. And that's a perfect example in real time based on what Davey just said. But Shane, share your thoughts. What do you think about this? Yeah, so I, I definitely think that it's still going on, but I think it's on a smaller scale, kind of like you were saying, Johnny, where it's like, you know, mostly resources that are not the bike. So like with Star, it seems to me, I mean, I'm obviously not there firsthand, but from what I'm seeing, they have generally all the same parts and the bikes are outfitted with the same motors. Everything's the same where it seemed like when I actually listened to that part of the podcast that you played and it sounded like Davey was elaborating that they he had better suspension, like actual components and things like that. So that was my understanding. But anyways, I think when it, like, for example, if we use the Deegan kitchen example, you know, I feel like say Deegan, he's got all the cameras on him. Everyone's, oh, you were four tenths faster in this rut right here and this and that. And Levi's like, what did I, you know, what about when I hit this triple, you know, was it better coming in the, from this side? And like, oh, we didn't, we didn't get that. Check the, check the timing or whatever, you know, so it could have been just something simple like that, or maybe, you know, the suspension techs are just giving one person a lot more time than the other and they feel like dude i'm trying to dial in my suspension too like what what's going on so i think that there's a lot of that going on and then i think that obviously like we know with kitchen i think it was also a lot of the just the loud fans and things that he didn't like but i do also think that he probably wasn't getting the full attention that he wanted you know from from the team um so i think we do have that going on and then you know now that he's on pro circuit I feel like, you know, like you said, they've just always been a four man team. So he knows, well, I'm going to pretty much be one of the guys, if not the guy over there, especially since I'm going on this coast or whatever, most likely. So he felt like he had a good opportunity to get all the attention he deserved and he would wouldn't have to deal with all the outside noise, too. Johnny, something to think about. And this is going to sound very harsh, but I hope everybody takes it with a grain of salt. One of the things that's been kind of a trend over the last five years is what is the rider bringing to the team? You know, I guess Kenny is probably one of the most, it's probably the best example of it because you look at, if I'm not mistaken, anybody can correct me if I'm wrong, but didn't, uh, didn't Roxon bring in progressive insurance and a lot of those big sponsors came over because Kenny was coming there. It's very, it's very similar to like what they do in car racing. If you look at some of these big Formula One race uh, cars, Indy cars, these type teams, uh, I was speaking with Jeff Ward when he the year that he got third at Indy 500, you know, yes, he had proven he had the talent to drive a car. But the discussion is, hey, we'll we'll put you in a car if you bring this amount of money so that we can go racing. And if you think about how much money did Broxon bring into that HEP team? whether it's progressive and, and all the different sponsors that are there, his own Red Bull, Fox, the Oakley, the whole nine yard. I think he's now a Fox goggle guy. Um, but to the point of, and I, I don't mind saying this publicly, we are negotiating with three MXGP teams where we want to be a feeder to be able to provide them up and coming riders in the one, two, five classes, what they refer to it in Europe. So talking with them straight up, they're like, all right, this is how much money it's going to cost you to put that rider on our team. They're literally emulating what the race car industry is doing, which I think is fascinating because it's no bullshit, no games, no nothing. It's like, this is what it's going to cost us. This is what it's going to cost you. <laughs> and if you can get us a rider. And so that's what we're trying to do is do things a little bit differently over here where we as a company are going to fund a young rider for three to four years here stateside with the idea of putting them into a placement. We're going to be sending them over to the UK and working with Richard McEwen, do some British British rounds, do some Scottish rounds, get used to living in some very cold, wet conditions. Can you cut the mustard, do that for three or four months, come back home if you like it. And, you know, we can get a lot of statistical data into the MXGP team's hands. 
Now we can start looking at Husqvarna, Kawasaki, some of these other teams that are over there and say, hey, I have cultivated a rider to hand them off to you, but I already understand it's going to cost me as a company X amount of dollars. So if I can offset the cost of the families to go over there, I can then provide a feeder program for these teams. Every one of them that I've spoken to has embraced the idea. But what I think is interesting is where did their model come from? Race cars. Bring the money and we'll go racing. Obviously, the talent has to be there. And that's what I was talking to with the team managers. They're not just going to take the money and just throw somebody underneath the awning. It's like, prove to me they're physical, physically capable. Show me they've got the mental toughness and then we'll talk. So if you look at Kenny and the money that he's bringing into that team, not like you say, no disrespect to McArath or, or Chisholm, but what was McArath? He's been like in the top five in the main event around the first turn, I think three times, four times already this year. Johnny, you're better with the statistics than I am. But like you said, he doesn't stay there. He gets back outside the top 10 within by the end of the race. Is that an equipment issue? I mean, nobody would say that McGrath is not good on a dirt bike. He's a champion. But I think it does validate, like you're saying, better parts. But it's also a byproduct of somebody bringing the money in to pay for those parts as well. Because we heard a lot about Kenny going back and forth with that suspension. I can't imagine how much just getting that set up cost Kenny. Oh, I absolutely. Mean, maybe what question is, is it Kenny or is it Hep? I guess that's the big question. Dude, a hemp, a hep. I, I hep. always think about like <laughs> uh the like marijuana stuff. For some reason it's just burned into my head. Maybe I'm just still a no um, pun intended. Boom. Yeah. Guys, we have 170 people here. Hit that like button for the YouTube algorithm so that it gets expanded to more people. And what's interesting is on the poll, I have saying that does favoritism in business happen in moto via parts and resources? And actually, 80% of you guys are saying yes, and 20% of you are saying maybe, but nobody is saying no. So it's, it's interesting. We're all on the same page here, and it's basically you have a pie when you only have so much to go around, you know, what's – you got to cut it somewhere. You can't just come up with more, more resources and stuff. So you end up kind of giving it to your, your best guy. So, um, I, well, I do think most of the Shane McArath and Chiz, those guys are more or less on a paid privateer bike where they get everything for free. They're getting a little bit of a salary, but it's not like a full blown semi factory deal is even what uh, Rocky mountain MC used to be. But those guys always, basically we're at a net negative when it went to racing. So again, it's, it's the same issue as far as like, how do you promote the sport more to where you get not just VP sponsors, but you get guys like progressive and target and, you know, more potentially even the, the alcohol companies or some of the, some of those guys that end up bringing in quite a bit more, more. Hey, Johnny, do you think the PC bikes are different from rider to rider? In regards to like we're saying Macarath to to Roxon. Do I think the PC bikes are different? If you laid those four bikes out and you looked at the internals, horsepower, I mean, yeah, setting the bike up for the rider's preferences is different. But if we're looking at Roxon's bike to Macarath's bike, big discrepancy. If we look at PC bike one, two, three, four, uh, maybe five, what you think there's gonna be much of a discrepancy between those bikes? I personally do not think there is. What do you think? I think there's probably a little bit, but it's just minute setups with a couple different pieces, parts that's available to all riders where the riders are like, Hey, I like these, this angle of triple clamps. The right, other riders right. like, no, I don't like that, but it's still the same brand. It's not literally like, Hey, we have this one factory ECU. That's 40 grand. It is going on Levi's bike and nobody right. else gets it. What that's do you think, what Shane? Think what do you think, Shane? I agree 100%. I think, like you said, maybe they might run a different type of clutch or a different, you know, ECU, like ECU settings or whatever based off of what they're trying to do to, you know, fit that rider's needs off the start or however they are on the throttle, you know, if they want to steer with the front or the back or whatever. But like you were saying, I think that pretty much they have the same equipment pool to pull from and then it's just whatever they choose to take and and put on their bike but it's probably going to be the same brand and everything like that seems like that's been a general thing with the pro circuit team as far back as i can remember that their bikes were pretty much their bikes their gear everything's always like identical 
Same with like the club bikes. I believe the club bikes are pretty similar all throughout. But watch what would happen if like say you had a Ken Roxon on club and got new money to go in and everything. Well, all that goes straight to that one rider as it should. As mm -hmm. it should, you know, mm -hmm. truthfully, that's, that's the way it, it should work. You know, but again, those teams are set up so totally different because like what Reese was saying in the, in the chat area, PC selling parts, pipes, stuff that you and I can buy. It's not those parts, but we think PC, we're like, okay, trust the, 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 the brand, trust the reliability, the, the work, workmanship and all that goes into it. But then when you look at like the Hep Suzuki team, what are they doing to sell, to go racing? I mean, that the family themselves they put a lot of their own money in then to get somebody like a Ken Roxon, you know, that's a, that's a couple million dollars that you've got to go raise from an outside sponsor. So that's where, like you say, if you're bringing the money in, obviously uh, you've got to be the one that's going to be getting the lion's share of the parts. Cause you're essentially paying for those, but look at how dynamic the teams are. PC sells to the public. You look at somebody like a star Yamaha, it's just a big tax write off for that team. And then you look over here, at the HEPs, especially since Kenny's been doing so well. It's it's an interesting dynamic. Johnny, you brought up a point. When we talk about trying to garner the attention of outside, outside the sport sponsors, one of the things that is really an eye-opener for me is if you go back and you listen to JGR's story, you know, uh, Joe Gibbs racing with their NASCAR team, they had a Home Depot car out on the track. And Joe Gibbs was quoted as saying that they offered the motocross team as an added value and Home Depot said, no, thank you. Now I think that screams volumes. Is that just because somebody didn't want the extra work that was attached to it? Did they not see the inherent value of it? Uh, are we as an industry, I'm not a promoter. I'm not a TV guy. I, I don't drive what gets conveyed on the television screen, but it certainly wasn't enough to blow the skirt up at the Home Depot brass and makes just makes you wonder um, I've said this on the show before, and I'll say it again here. What happened to the money of the Chevy trucks? Uh, I've been in the business world for 35 years. I know that you could have a new marketing director comes in, doesn't feel like the moto market is our thing, and the ad agency moves the money elsewhere. I understand that. But where did the Makita dollars go? Where did the Sam Manuel dollars go? Where um, I think about Ricky and all the sponsors he had. Makita is the one that I always think about, cool power tool company. Well, if it's not Makita... What about some of the other power tool companies? Why are why are they not coming in as an industry? You look at Sam Manuel, right? We started seeing a little bit more on the 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 casino Cause, side you know, of things some with of the dark stuff. Yeah, you saw Ken Roxon, uh, Kenny Watson did a great job. Went out, got Dodge, and got the casino. And then you look at like if we use Kenny Watson as an example, he went out and got Jimmy Johns. And when they had Ken Roxon on the team, you know, had Jimmy Johns was at the top of the jersey. Well, the TV crew, because Jimmy John's was not a sponsor of the series, they focused the TV on to make sure that Jimmy John's was not being seen. So Jimmy John's, the owner, is like, screw this sport. I'm out. So the sport mm -hmm. is hurting itself in those type of little catty things. It's kind of like – go it, ahead. It is, sorry, Coach. I don't mean to ahead, interrupt no, you. I no, think no, things are, out there. are changing. Like I had a meeting with um, the guys that are – running supercross and, and davy coombs and mm -hmm. one of the biggest things that they have been doing is they're giving everyone an opportunity to share to promote because um one of the last books i read on, on marketing it was talking about how much social media has changed perception and, and create dollars where advertisers are more willing to now uh go with influencers etc guys like deegan because it's cheaper as opposed to a normal commercial on the tv which could cost a hundred times more than what somebody else could do and, and arguably like somebody like deegan is getting comparably as many views as what happens on saturday night for supercross so why wouldn't you go with something like that and so i think the sport allowing other content creators and even the riders to use their own content, but not lock everything down has been a pivotal moment where it's just kind of a, a roller coaster in change because, you know, at the beginning we talked about the riders with, uh, the Baker's factory, how, when you had these guys, James Stewart and Dungey and Zach Osborne and Webb, when they're all on the bandwagon of that, it's all going good. But when they get burnt out, like a Jason Anderson, they leave, they're left with no up and coming kind of a guy. 
where there's these other teams that have got these amateur guys that they're getting from the Supercross Futures that are being able to build it back up. So the Baker's Factory almost seems like it's having to start from scratch. And I think the sport, long-winded answer, is needing to really revamp and start it from scratch. I will quote Davey Coombs. As Davey Coombs said that what they're trying to do is they're trying to help Supercross be smaller while Supercross is trying to help motocross be a little bit bigger, but not as locked down. When you said, when at the beginning of what you just talked about there, when you said they, who is they allowing for more? I, I'm a little confused on your comment. They are right. allowing no, more people. Entertainment where they're not locking down and they're not content striking and they're not like having these strict, strict rules that you can't um, promote anything. Yeah, they still have the rules as far as you can't be selling merchandise or anything unless you cut them in on it, which I still think that that's a decent thing. Like the jets and donuts and all that, uh, there's a percentage that is going to fail for him selling a, a large percentage is going to fail. A very large percentage is going maybe to it should be less, you know, well, but. that's, that's okay. I mean, uh, th we're not here to argue that the thing that I, I have, mean, a, yeah. the, where I have to discontinue, where I have to disagree with you ever so slightly is they saying that they're trying to grow the sport, but then, they don't allow Chad Reed to run a certain camera. And then when GoPro goes away, all the, think about it. We have, because GoPro went out of the sport and nobody else is willing to pay, that category is excluded, not allowed to have them. They want to declare it's a safety issue. But yet we put GoPros on the front of the KTN Junior Challenge bikes. Seems a little contradictory to me. Uh, we can't have a CBD company with Chad Reed. You got to cover it up next summer. It's all around the track. Um, we, we have yeah, a promoter small. that poaches the money from Geico Honda that's coming directly from Michael Grundle, where, you know, he's, a, here's a guy who was putting money into the team and the money gets poached from the team. And then all of a sudden it's on the side of the track. So I have a little bit of a problem with a group of people saying they're trying to grow it. And I'm not trying to be Debbie Downer or negative. It's just what's being said. And then what materializes seems to be two different things. And like I said, I'm not on a witch hunt. I just sit back and I listen to what people say. And then I try to watch what comes out of it. And it doesn't always align. Coach, coach, you're absolutely 1000% correct. I, I do agree with you to an extent here. I'm kind of contradicting myself by saying That's I agree. Okay. With you, but, then, um, right. but anyway, my, my point is, yes, there it's goes back to that whole thing where it's hard to teach an old dog new tricks, right? Mm -hmm. Nobody, it's the pie. Feld doesn't want to release any of they're making good money. They're making good money, but everyone else is not making as much money. So they don't want to give some pieces to other people so that eventually it grows a much bigger pie and then they're going to ultimately make more money, right? That's, that's the simple mindedness. So I, I believe the sport is trying to change and there are people including like this podcast in a certain way, like this channel and everything that we represent is trying to nudge at these guys to be like, Hey, let's make it to where everyone is aware of how much money the riders make. Okay, cool. They make so little money. Well, now there's a problem. Everybody knows there's a problem. Let's change it. But if nobody knows that there's a problem, nothing is going to change. So maybe the big corporations are trying to hide a little bit of the problems because they don't want to them be public to then have to do some PR stuff. But ultimately, that's the only way you're going to have to change it is by making but, it. But see, I, I have to politely disagree with you because the NFL doesn't censor ESPN when they say that this was a shit ref job. They don't say that this was a shit whatever, right? I disagree with you because I don't believe that the industry is going, hey, guess what? We need to go ahead and relax the copyright strikes. Well, the reason why they're having to relax the copyright strikes is because people like yourself and people like Shane have gained so much more momentum that where before they could suppress the narrative and they could control the narrative in the direction, the system has started to overrun what they used to be able to manipulate and control. So now they're saying, oh, oh, no, we're, we're very cooperative. We love you guys. We want to be a part of it where that's bullshit. They started to get steamrolled and realize they are starting to lose the grip on it. So if you're good and you're charismatic and you know how to spin the truth, you say, look, look at us, look at how much we've changed. Listen to how much we've adapted to what you guys have wanted. No, the environment has mandated a change, but they still want to get credit for the change. Deegan is the perfect example. If Deegan is pissed off about something, Brian Deegan can get it out to 50 million people in a nanosecond. Well, my gosh, when all of a sudden now Brian Deegan has a voice on a platform 
I know it's being censored. Instagram's pretty bad, but for all intents and purposes, right? Somebody who's got a disgruntled opinion about something or somebody who got shit on can get it out there. And now these promoters are like, oh, wow, wait a second. We better, sh- we, ne- we need to present a story. But that coach, we, that's we just what I was saying. Where, where yeah, but you're saying that they're proactively doing it. I think they're reactively doing it because, like you said, the numbers are starting to okay. show that you they don't have it. a little bit of what I was saying. Like maybe okay. I, I was saying it botched, right? Okay. But the point is like the pressure is forcing them to change, right? They are resistant to change, but because of the light of things that are happening, sure. Sure. they are, look at me, I'm playing with Legos here because of my daughter, <laughs> but um, they're, it's happening. It's happening. It's just, it's just taking a little while for it to happen. Like, again, um, we've talked about this before, as far as the writers currently are not going to stand for changes being made because there's going to be, they've, they've built up such a backlog of privateers that are willing to ride for free in the whole business model with star and pro circuit, where it's, we're not going to pay you a salary. And the same thing with the mechanics, like, Hey, no health insurance, no, none of this. There's so many of those people that are willing to just be a part of the sport that they're not going to ask for change, but it's going to happen in the next couple generations because of the things that are happening with social media and myself included yourself, Shane, bringing these attentions to the people where in the next five to 10 years, we might see some major changes that are being forced by the corporations, right? What, I, I what, what corporations are going to, what for, what, what, what corporations are going to force that elaborate on that just real quick for Shane shares his thought. I, I, I'm, I'm saying as far as Feld entertainment, MX sports, AMA, you know, we've already seen rules being changed that have not adhered to the responsibility of the riders. And there, there's lots of things that are being proactive. We, we see a lot with the safety. You've got many changes going on where they're actively trying to improve because you'd rather – it's almost like putting in a red light once there's a giant accident – you know, now you're like, okay, cool. I have to change this now before even more things go wrong. Right? Then why? Because then why wasn't Jordan Smith black flagged on Saturday night? Okay, He's completely in a different zip here, code. Shane, here, let, let's yeah, hear let me get my thought out real quick. Yeah, and go we'll ahead, switch Shane. To that. Sorry. <laughs> okay, so um, I have something to consider as far as this all goes. So I think, like Johnny's saying, kind of the industry is changing. Social media is forcing it, and the corporations like Feld and MX sports are going to have to adapt with that, you know, as, as they get put pressure by whatever outside forces. But I also think that the sport is limited by other factors back to your comparison coach of say like the JGR team with the home Depot sponsorship. The thing, I, I have no idea what went on with that, but just looking at it from, you know, above what I would imagine is say, if I'm a home Depot executive, I could look at the sport of NASCAR and I have, the front hood sponsorship. So that's obviously a very large logo and they have the back fenders and whatever. So that's obviously on the front of the car. They're doing hundreds of laps every weekend. And whenever that car's on camera, it's like a clearly visible logo, which is one thing. But then you also have to take into account that now they're making die cast cars of that car. And then they're making kids die casts that are in Walmart target and they're selling as many of those cars and they're ending up in people's houses or stores all throughout the country and the world. And so that sponsorship is going so much further than say, if they sponsor a team like JGR racing back when they were doing motocross, they're going to get on the plastics and then a placement on the Jersey. You can't read any of that during the race. So really all it's going to be is interviews and then, you know, still shots, stuff like that. And then realistically, only recently with the Dirt Master or Spin Master, whatever the toys are, are when we started getting like real efficient, officially licensed toys that were really in publicly available stores. And even with that, it's not the same as like a, another mainstream motorsport like NASCAR. So I feel like to really get those outside sponsorships, like you said, where San Manuel or the other power tools, like, you know, DeWalt was a... a I think they might still be, but they were a NASCAR sponsor for years, you know? So how do we get those outside companies to come in that are not necessarily related to 
motocross to come in and bring money like we see right now with progressive and i think that's really hard because all they're really getting is a a big place on the side of a semi and then a spot on a piece of plastic on the bike and a jersey slot and then you get your little thing next to the rider on the timing and scoring but it's really not it's not comparable to i think a lot of other motorsports and the and the you know what what they bring to the table as far as being able to spread that company's name around so i feel like we need to try to find a way to improve that as well if we want to continue to grow outside sponsorship that's a great point yep Agreed. Michael says here that it's just everything can be exposed now, right? Everyone has a cell phone that can show something here. So the sport has to somewhat change as damages come in for, for damage control. And to be fair, it's it's a problem in most two-wheel motorsports. I was talking with uh, some of my family this weekend, and they're big into road racing. And I guess most of the guys on the gosh, I want to say world Superbike series and the moto two, a good portion, 80% of them are paying to race. There's only a few guys that are actually getting paid to race. Like how crazy is this? You have the best riders in the world that are paying to race. And that's the same thing with this sport. Everyone pays to race, which is crazy. Absolutely crazy. Well, um, unfortunately and- it's just because they don't have a representation. I mean, that's what it bottoms down. That's what the bottom line is, Johnny. I mean, there's and not a baseball that's... player that's going to show up or a football player that would show up for free. And and that's what I'm saying is it's going to take a a big swing in the tide, but over things go down much faster than they go up. And Amen. what I'm saying is the sport is slowly, gradually increasing, right? Because people are becoming aware of the issues and things are starting to get to get solved. And the whole goal of this podcast and everything is to be part of the solution, not Mm -hmm. just pick apart stuff and go, Oh, this this bullshit, this bullshit. I'm never rating. Yeah, no. But but when you, but whenever we've talked about something, that's a problem. We've always tried to provide a solution. That that's just something that you and I've talked about off the air. We're not here to bitch and moan and groan. We're here about you. You can't, you can't fix what you don't know is broken, right? If you're in an interpersonal relationship and I keep offending you and you don't tell me I'm offending you, how am I supposed to know what to fix if I don't know what's wrong? And so like, we've got a couple of people in the chat room right here that are like, oh, I'm, I'm Mr. Debbie Downer, that my whole brand is about negativity. I find that quite humorous because you're missing the entire point of the conversation. It's, it's not that we're saying something is wrong and it sucks and it's never going to change. When you look at other sports that started small and grew and blossomed and grew and blossomed, why not emulate success? I guess that's what I'm dumbfounded by. When you when when somebody likes to like throw darts at me and say, "Oh, you're being Debbie Downer," how am I being Debbie Downer when I'm saying, "Here's where we are, Coach." And- Sorry, I'm- no. Go ahead. No. no, 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 no. I'm really bad at this. I'm just gonna play with my Legos. Finish. No, no. Me. It's it's just the idea that I just on this. In our business line, right, we're on this side of the telephone talking to moto parents and they voice their discontent of driving three days across the country to put a total of 18 minutes on their motorcycle. So they go, you know what, we're done with amateur racing. We're going to go race GNCCs. Well, they just went from one family to the other because MX Sports owns both of them. I'm not making up that people are frustrated. They don't get a chance to ride much. I talk to people that are over in Europe. When they show up to race, the only thing they pay for is racing. They don't pay a gate fee. They don't pay a pit bike fee. They don't pay for printouts. They don't pay for a transponder. They pay for a race entry. And what's interesting is there'll be a two-day race. The race promoter will actually provide dinner for everybody on Saturday night. But yet you go to one of our amateur races over here and you freaking can't move three feet without getting hit with another expense. Now, if you want to say that I'm being Debbie Downer. But isn't that capitalism? Is it capitalism or is it extortion? I mean, for Pete's sakes, I own a piece of property. Look at something like mini, look at something like Minio's where the square, I mean, the distance from the track to way out by where some of the RVs can get to, that'd be a 20 minute walk. So I buy a pit bike, but when I bring my motor home in, I got to pay to park my motor home. I got to pay for every person in the motor home just to watch, even though they're going to spend money. I've got to pay for a pit bike that I pull out. I got to pay for a transponder each class. Every time I register for a class, It's $60 to race a class. $20 goes to MX Sports for what? To say it's an area or it's a regional? 
when you have a race last weekend that had 2,000 participants in it and MX Sports gets 20 bucks because it's a area race, for what? And then I got to pay for a pit bike pass and I got to pay who? for, it's like, at some point, where do you, where do you draw the line? I just it's think it's pie, ridiculous. Coach. It's the pie. Like the ultimate deal is people are trying to make money. At oh, making money is one thing, Johnny, but for Christ's sake, when, when you've got a, a pit bike to just move around the pits and you you got to, you got to put a fee on my sticker. You got to put a sticker on my bike. Yeah, if you're worried, if you're worried, like, world if you're worried, racing is an even bigger problem because um, the entry fees are triple. The track fees are triple. The the parts and tires for that stuff is triple. Like racing motorcycles is is okay. What riding your bike through the pits is it is a triple expense to the the race promoter? It's in a field. Well, that's only on the big nationals, the the big amateur nationals, coach. No, it's and not. No, it's not. Well, here in Colorado, you don't have to pay for a pit bike. Um, and I believe in Arizona, you don't have to pay for a pit bike if you're running around, uh, just needing to go from here to there or a golf cart or anything of that nature. The only time I've ever had to pay for that stuff is when I was at Minio's or Ponca City or something. And, and there's a reason why Ponca's not on the, the deal anymore. Probably the okay. same reason. Okay. Is so you, you just literally solidified my point. You priced the community right out of being able to go racing. And now we lose a legendary event because of politics and excessive greed. You keep telling me you want the sport to grow. Oh, allow I love me, it, Coach. I'm getting you. I can, allow, I can, allow I can me to bring my, between well, allow, <laughs> allow me to bring my family to the races so I can enjoy riding my dirt bike and my family can enjoy watching. And they're going to buy hot dogs and they're going to buy Cokes and they're going to spend money there. But my gosh, it's like nickel, dime, nickel, dime. And when you start seeing something where you've got 22, 23, 3,000 entries at many O's, and so it's a monopoly it. problem is what you're saying. I have no problem with capitalism. If somebody can build a better widget, build it. The problem is if you and Shane and I decide that we want to start a race organization, unfortunately, it's going to be an uphill battle. I have no problem with that. That's competition. But when you now, you, the three of us want to start a race series and we go to a racetrack. Well, if a racetrack has signed an agreement to have an area or a regional MX Sports gets to approve whether or not we can go to that racetrack or not. So I have a problem with that because now the, the race owner, the track owner, right? He's looking at an executive decision. Bring us three new guys on who has no track record trying to build something. And if I if they if the racetrack well, well, allows us to come, then they're gonna lose their area or regional. Come on. To to debate you. The whole monopoly deal is is different than the whole capitalism. Capitalism is like everyone builds up, and and if you can do it better and cheaper, you do it better and cheaper. But when there's a big monopoly, it's the same thing that I talked about with at the beginning of the show with Apple. You know, it basically cuts every other small startup out of out of the equation because they can't they can't even compete. So there's mm -hmm. no point in competing, and but therefore why, your, why change? But hold your thought there. What's the number one thing that the government can do to make a company grow? Cut taxes. When you cut taxes, the companies reinvest in resources, humans, more equipment. And what's the taxable revenue to the government when they tax, when they cut taxes to corporations and corporations have more money to spend, and then they spend it on more resources and more people who go and spend more money buying more parts to replace, the revenue that comes in goes up. If you're looking at the end product, capitalism at its finest, right? So if you would reduce the cost of the average person to go racing and encourage it, I could buy three bikes instead of only having one. So now, you, now you've got three bikes bought. Agreed, agreed. Now and, I can and, get my son in it. But my point is, is when you're talking about capitalism and growth, it's one thing to just price gouge everybody and try to just poach as much as you can. If you say that your intentions are to grow the sport, make it to where it's a little bit more enjoyable. You're going to get your money in a, in a more indirect way, but the indirect increase in revenue comes from the growth of the sport, not poaching a shitload of money out of the very few people. We love the sport. We would we will do everything we can. We work our asses off to go ride. But we're, again, I'm not saying anything should be for free. But when you go to a national, like I refuse to go to many O's. I absolutely refuse. And here's the reason why. I drove from Orlando to take my son up there. I had 31 riders that, at Minio's that year. We went on a Tuesday. 
We pull up to the gate and they say, look, you got to pay cash only and you have to pay, I think it was $160. I said, to go watch a race? They go, yeah. I go, I'm only here for one day and I'm here to watch my son. I'm here to watch, just watch races with my son. They go, no, it's cash, 160 bucks. You got to buy the wrist for, bracelet for the whole week. I said, I'm not here for the whole week. I'm not racing. I'm what? No, it's $160 cash. I didn't take $160 cash. I took $50 with me because I figured we'd get a little bit of food and it'd probably cost 10 or 15 bucks for each of us to watch. Do you not see a problem with that? For Christ's sake, you've got, if there's 2,000 racers, if you multiply it by 2.2, you're looking at four to 5,000 people and they have to buy a wrist brace for the entire week just to spectate because you're at the privilege of being at a national. And, and that is kind of trickled down to no, even all the amateur racing, where even if you're on practice, you buy a wrist brand for the race, even if you're not going to race at there. And, and that's, that's, I believe a little bit of, again, I'm using that word, the capitalism where the track is trying to earn money. And so <laughs> they are making these fees because there's so many other fees from the promotion, AMA, things of that nature. I so, disagree. I disagree. Well, okay. Well, when, so you, what I'm saying, when you sign up for the race, you, you have to pay 20 bucks to MX sports. The race, the race promoter doesn't. When you look at your race entry, okay, it but, says 40 for the race and 20 to MX sports. Your cost is 60. That promoter is not paying that 20 bucks. Your I know the promoter it's, it, it per se, maybe it's a little bit of a double dipping because it's the same thing we've said about having a national and everything you, you pay to have it there. So the promoters then have to try to, or I would say the track owners have to try to make stuff out here. So if there was cut costs with everything, again, we need to have more tracks come up here. And that's my whole solution with the electric bikes where you get more people in and it's, it's a turning of the tide coach. We're back to here. How do we get more people involved and how do we get, um, because it's a supply and demand thing. There is less demand Therefore, the supply goes up and everything is costing more. So you're right. If we cut taxes and it's going to trickle down to the consumer, right? But let's let's move on to what we wanted to talk about as well when it comes to uh, concussions and Jordan Smith. I, I love the conversation, Coach. Um, we could talk about this for a while. We'll probably continue to, to talk about this because they are important issues that we should get up. And maybe let me give Shane a chance. Between the two of us, you don't have to pick. You can you can be indifferent. What are your thoughts as somebody there in California, the state of the economy, the sport in general, everything we've yeah. been going over? So I feel like I could sum this issue up pretty quickly. Um, as I was telling Coach, I think you stepped out before we started, but I'm more. I have really deep motor roots. I've been following it for a long time, but I grew up BMX racing, and in BMX racing is basically sanctioned by one body just like mx sports kind of sanctions a lot of the moto events um so it's the same thing and i feel like really the issue is like you said coach if they truly are trying to grow the sport then why are we getting nickel and dimed everywhere you know they're not putting their money where their mouth is so to speak and i think the problem right now is that yeah there are people who are like this is crap you know i drove all the way across the country and my son was on the track for whatever 18 minutes or 18 you know minutes and <coughs> excuse me so that part you know you are you are losing people and it's the same in in my sport of bmx there's people who go to a national say they fly to wherever they fly their bikes everyone goes they trained all month and then they go out in motos and they're like i just spent five thousand dollars for three laps so yep, they exactly. leave the sport but the problem is the majority of the people are paying the $160 and whatever more so than they're not. And so I think until there's like an uprising or some sort of a union established or something that where it's like, cause MX sports, for example, they're just, they, they say they want to grow the sport. So that way the people that are okay with paying keep paying and it just sounds good. And then they don't lose their whatever their pie is, as long as it's the same size generally each year, they're fine and they got their money and they don't actually, like you said, they could lower the cost, grow the sport and increase their profits, but they don't necessarily care about increasing their profits. I don't think, I think it's just that they want to make this amount of money and they're happy with that and just keep it stable, keep the machine working. And I see that in the same, same thing in my sport, everything's just kind of, it could grow so much. It's grown just like motocross has grown. It, but the percentage of the amount that it's grown is so much smaller than what it potentially could grow if they really attacked it and tried to 
strategize their pricing and everything like that. Well, I will so, rebuttal. Finish, finish what you're saying, Shane. Yeah, so I just think that as far as that goes, if they if they wanted to, I think they could, you know, regulate the pricing. MX Sports could say, hey, this is the price for that. You can't, whatever, you can only charge this much for admission, this much for parking, no pit bike fees, whatever. They could regulate all that, and it would make people like whoever. It's like, oh, wow, they brought the fees down, and I'm not getting nickel and dime so much maybe it's worth going and it would increase that and then it would also spread the word people would want to go more and it would increase the turnout and then in turn increase the profit um but i don't think that they actually are looking at that i think they're aware of it and they're just choosing to ignore it essentially if you guys are enjoying this conversation make sure you subscribe and you hit that like button because we're, we're trying to add value here uh shane i don't disagree with you there are some obvious problems in the sport However, it, it's hard not to give credit where credit is due with the Super Motocross Championship. And that is possibly because of what World Supercross is doing, which is great. That's the whole capitalism I'm talking about. If they can't do 100%. it better, then you have somebody else with Adam Bailey getting a bunch of investors involved and in creating something different for more opportunities. So what happens to MX Sports and Feld? They have to level up. And now they're... Um, giving 10 million more to the professionals and everything as well. So that there is, there is some good that's coming out of here. So there is changing and it's not all going to happen at once. And that's why there is a lot of guys that are, are going to things that aren't AMA sanctioned anymore, where you have local tracks starting to create their own deals because there is too much money being spent in by, by the bigger sanctioning um, bodies. And, And I guess I will say it's, it's an evil thing from all deal. Like I just had to withdraw from this Iron Man this next week because I've got some, some injuries and I tried to get my money back and I tried not, well, I honestly tried not to get my money back. I tried to just transfer my Iron Man from Oceanside to Boulder. And they were like, Oh no, no, we can't do that. You have to do it two months beforehand. I'm like, how am I supposed to know if I'm going to get injured two months ago? Like, I don't know. Come on, guys. I'm supporting you. And and guess what the audacity they had to say? They said, well, you can withdraw yourself. And I'm like, no, F you guys. No way am I withdrawing myself from the event. So now you can fill another spot for somebody else to pay $500. This is just being greed. Yep. So ultimately, I think the issue is greed. And it has to do with how people were raised and how it, it it's going to take a while for things, like I said, not our generation, but younger generations. We we let everybody aware of the problem. We can try to fix it, but it's ultimately going to be done from our kids, right? That's well, a whole thing let's, with politics. Let, let's let's look at something. Hard. Let's look at something that's in Shane's world. Shane is in the BMX world. If you go back to the early 80s, you had two groups. You had the National Bicycle League, NBL, and you had ABA, American Bicycle Association. Very quietly behind the scenes, those two became one. And now you have, what? It, what is the association? It's just the governing UCI, right? No, it's USA BMX. UCI USA. is the international one. All right, thank you. So now you have US BMX. So now what you've got is a huge monopoly and the racing has gone nowhere but down. Sorry, that's just the way I feel. The, the, I've, I've, I have the privilege of working with quite a few BMXers. I work with Nathan Glab. He's one of the best uh, BMX coaches in Australia. I get a chance to work with all these guys. And once again, the politics, right? And so for the people that are saying I'm Debbie Downer in the in the chat room area, you need to open your freaking eyes and look at history. If you continue just to ignore it and say, that's just the way it is, Johnny, this is where I politely disagree with you as well. You would have never seen MX Sports and Feld ever become partners had you not had WSX become a reality. That's exactly what, what I was saying. Is yeah, like, exactly. Um, but you're saying that they stepped up and came up with $10 million. No, they did it because they 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 were starting to look like fools because- I know, hey, but look, they stepped up, right? Well, yeah, but- They had to, they had to respond somehow. Okay, so so you, you and I, our wives are mad at us because we don't take them on date night. So we finally take them to date night. And we're like, all right, you happy? We took you on date night. They're like, well, that really wasn't, there wasn't a lot to that. So they're like, yeah, you took us on date night, but you're still a dick, right? Because you're only doing it because they raised enough hell for you to take them on date night. That's all we're seeing. Now, I'm thankful for the riders. I'm thankful that the money is there. I think it's interesting. 
The promoters say that they're not making much money, but they came up with $10 million. I don't care if it comes from NBC money. I don't really care. The money was found. The money was put together. Why does it take that you have to feel threatened before you do something proactively for the growth of the sport? Exactly what Shane just surmised earlier. Yep. Yeah, it's a whole putting in the stoplight after something has happened. It's right. not prevention. Yeah. I, um, I don't want somebody doing something because they felt like they had to. Do what needs to be done for the right reasons. And if you say you want to grow the sport, do it for the right reasons. Make it less expensive. Allow us to be able to keep a little bit more of our money so we can buy more coach, bikes. More I, parts. I come from um, from finance, right? Yeah, yep. And that's the reason why I got out of finance is because it was greed. You know, it's business. Mm -hmm. You You can't succeed when you have a moral high ground on stuff. You have to do a morally wrong things to kind of get ahead. And unfortunately, like that's not the, the, the story I want to tell the viewers. And right. I don't want to be perceived as somebody that's peddling that information. Of course. Right. But there, there can be a middle ground mm -hmm. where yes, you are aggressive and it's the same thing with writers, right? It's the same thing with writers. Those exactly. who succeed are the ones that have the, the no fucks attitude. Make it happen. Where, you break check people and you just, you, you can do dirty things. Like look at Lance Armstrong and we could argue that Ricky Carmichael was the Lance Armstrong of motocross. I'm not going to say with the whole peds things, but just being that like, Hey, this is how it's fucking done. This is how we're doing it. Boom. If you don't like it, I'm going to find somebody else. Right. Yeah. Lead that follower, kind of get out of the way. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Lead but follower, get out of the way. It works. It works. But yeah. there's a changing of the tide in mm -hmm. society where we don't want to really be led by these red personalities as much, but here um, let's, as we end the show, let's, let's talk about the last deal here yeah. with what happened between Jordan Smith, Oh, Jordan Smith. Painful. It looks as if he hit, can I put this sucker in slow motion settings? Playback speed. It looks as if he doesn't hit his head, but it does knock the wind out of him. So with my experience, mm. obviously you can get a concussion without physically hitting your head on the ground. So when he hit the bar pad and his head went forward, that looked like a hard enough head, you know, whiplash that it could have caused some head trauma. But based off of how his chest hit the bars right there, to me, that's right where your lungs are at. So watch right here when he uh so he's up and then he gets over the front and then watch when his front wheel hits bam right there so that was right here on his chest so i am concerned about how his head came down and then stopped so quickly but i'm more thinking that the way that impacted his chest it, it pushed all the air out of his lungs which i made that comment on one of my videos and then i later saw his instagram post saying that's what happened but what I'm the point I'm trying to make is when when you hit that part of the of your chest, I've done that myself, and you know it, it blows all the air out of your lungs, and then you can't inhale. And so what I'm thinking is obviously he's towards the end of the main event, so his heart rate's got to be peaked out. You know he's already running a high heart rate, and if you're not able to breathe to keep up with your heart rate as it is, that's going to spike it even more, and you're going to have a loss of oxygen in your blood. And so from my experience and understanding of how that all works is you lose a lot of motor control, the higher your heart rate is. And so I feel like his, a lot of his decision-making could have been, you know, off just based off of the lack of oxygen to his brain and his extremities. And then also, I think one thing that we're also potentially overlooking, which I overlooked myself at first is what about his bike? So if you see right here, when it lands, I think his right, handlebar kind of drags a little bit um and i think it might have been a little twisted up so those ruts particularly on this straightaway where he crashed and then obviously when he had the issues again i don't know his bike looks like it should have been fine but yeah. either way <clears throat> if his bike was twisted at all that's going to make it even harder he could have even twisted his bars just a bit from that case so uh, I say it's safe to be. say we can rule out the bike as being a, a detrimental factor to the way he was riding afterwards, but it, it might have a small percentage. Yeah. Of... But this, the ruts alone, just on the straightaway, were obviously pretty rough. But whatever the case may be, the next lap when he came around, he 
totally didn't look right. He obviously almost jumped off the track on the other rhythm section. He came around the turn, did jump off the track on this rhythm section, and then came back on without looking. And I would say that's the one part that is really a red flag to me is irregardless of how you were able to ride, you should have the awareness to try to at least look before you pull back onto the track, regardless of how, you know, hard it was to ride your bike or how, you know, you were, hadn't caught your breath yet. You should, if your head was all there, you should have been able to stop at the tough block and look before he pulled onto the track. So that's where I think you can make an argument towards head trauma. Mistake. Well, to me, you've got, you've got three things that based on what Shane just said, if you look at the lack of oxygen, that's one thing. The fact that he made a, a mistake by not looking on the track was the second. Take it one step further. What if that had been the leaders? Because he he took out two guys when he got back on the track, right? He I mean right. he didn't clean them out, but he you know got in their way. If you're not cognizant, because you didn't even look, that nope. very seriously could have been the leaders of the race. The industry would be having a completely different conversation about hey, why in the world was he allowed to continue to race? And this is, again, Johnny, goes back to what you've said numerous times. You know, if you're a privateer, screw you. You know, sorry, we <laughs> messed up your race. That's just the way it goes. But if that had been one of the other factory teams, you can guarantee there would be petitions filed. There'd be protests filed. They would want some kind of a points of penalties, something. Because in all fairness, it could have been a, a, a game changer. Like with Jordan, he went from being only a couple points down to he's almost a full moto behind at just one race. That's how quickly the momentum can shift. Well, can you imagine essentially somebody who's hurt goes and takes out, let's just say in this case, he cleans out the leader. And now all of a sudden it's like a huge points shift, you know, but because it wasn't another factory ride, we go, well, you know, it is what it, in fact, I haven't heard hardly any discussions other than the fact that it was a big hit. And Jordan, once again, has done what Jordan always does, and that uh, starts with a bang and ends up losing the series because of an injury. Well, it's it's the narrative, right? You can mm -hmm. control it, and you can say that, hey, look at the McAdoo. Look at the how how badass you are to be able to do this stuff. But if, if we're trying to be as big as some of the other sports, what happens in F1 and those things is the teams and the riders take a big financial penalty for for potentially misconduct on stuff. And I think we do see quite a bit of changing with Deegan with all of his antics. The sport is being forced to like, okay, enough is enough. I know we have the Jason Anderson and Barsha deal. We can't just put Deegan on promotion because it's still going to happen. We're going to have to have some sort of harsher penalties. And, and maybe that's more of a, a democratic, Democratic way of looking at it because the big sports if we look at the supreme deals in motorsports it's f1 and it's essentially um it's somewhat of a, a dictatorship and it, it's not it's not conservative uh and however coach and shane in this incident I don't know how the medical professionals could assess this guy because the race was almost over at this point. And yeah, he ended up getting in the way of some other riders, but it, I would say it was a luck thing. Nothing crazy happened. So it can be written off as nothing bad happened, but we have never seen somebody get a medical black flag before for the safety of the riders. And I don't know what it's going to take to see something like that. But in this instant with five minutes left to go in the race, how do you assess a rider to make it to where he's not suitable to continue? A few years ago with the McAdoo incident, what well, it wasn't at Daytona, it was at Atlanta. Anyway, it's semantics. What happened there was there was literally a red flag restart. So there was enough time given to be able to assess a rider. In this situation, it's all happening inside of like 30 seconds. So yeah. I don't I don't know. I think the medical professionals did the best with what they could right there. Yeah, I think I can answer that. So I don't think you can really assess him. If you look at the race, I believe there was an alpine star in between the lanes and he ran up to him and obviously did like a quick, hey, are you OK or something, whatever was said. And he obviously got his breath, got back on the bike and continued. And I think that the answer to your question johnny is that you you really can't assess a rider in that time frame and you really can't make them stop to be assessed especially like with jordan's situation he's in the championship fight so every second it's going to potentially be a position and a point and it's going to matter 
So unfortunately, I think what you have to do is let them go back on the track and show whether they are a danger to themselves and the other riders. And then in Jordan's instance where he pulled back onto the track and showed that a complete lack of awareness and potentially a lack of capability to safely ride around the track, then that's when you would discuss, hey, are we black flagging this guy? He's a hazard. And I think you see the same thing in other motorsports where, you know, a car has an issue or something and then whatever, they go back onto the track and all of a sudden they're spraying debris on the track. It's like, hey, this guy's a hazard. You got to black flag him. But he's allowed that chance back onto the track and then say they have to throw a caution flag to clean up the debris or whatever. And that's the consequence. But I think you just you got to let those guys do what they are going to do and then assess them as they're continuing the race. And then if they show themselves to be unfit to continue, then you have to black flag him. Johnny, what was the race that McAdoo uh, got his feet hung up over the over under slammed his head? They started the race and then through that rhythm section on the opening lap, McAdoo crashed somebody that had to be they had a bunch of medical damage. And who I, I want to say Benny Bloss, but that's not Benny. Who was it that McAdoo landed on and he had all kinds of issues that had to be flight for lighted out? I don't remember if he had to be flighted out, but I remember he got banged up pretty bad. Uh, you know, so are you talking about where McAdoo landed on him? Yeah. And I can't remember who the rider was for the sake for the life of me, for whatever reason in my brain, it always goes blows. Blow. Wasn't it March banks or it, it was Chris blows that, that happened. It was blows. Big, okay. Oh. So my, my head was okay. This is the problem that I have with it. And you know me, I'm not into redistribution of wealth whatsoever, but so you got McAdoo who smashes his head. They restart the race. They allow him to restart the race. Now, again, let's go back and let's say that that was another factory rider that's in the points race and your rider gets completely obliterated because somebody who you know just smashed his head is allowed to restart. His judgment isn't 100% there. He smashes your rider, severely hurts him. When you're looking at the exactly what Shane just said, the ramifications of black flagging, cost versus benefit, if McAdoo, I mean, let's face it, it's because we're looking at it in hindsight, it's very easy. If McAdoo hadn't been allowed to restart, we we can safely say there's a better chance that Blos wouldn't have gotten hurt. Somebody else could have run into him, but he was hit by somebody who's concussed. So to Shane's example, hey, black flag him, come in, have the have the medical. And I know there's only five minutes left, and I know there's points on the board, but to continue to let him race, and then you have something that exactly what we've already seen with McAdoo happen. I think we have enough of a pre-existing situation to be able to make an executive decision and go, that's what we're trying to avoid. Would you not agree with that? I I think unfortunately what we're going to have to see is like a Dale Earnhardt type of incident where there's a, like the Chris Blos and McAdoo thing was pretty bad, but I think we're going to have to see like a catastrophic turn of events to really change the tide on what's the standard. Like when you had the Dale Earnhardt death, it started to turn the tide as far as all the they started to mandate Hans devices and to, you know, the head and neck restraint for the drivers. Some people were wearing them, but then it became mandated and they started creating the safer barrier walls and things like that. The industry changed completely, the cars, everything, yada, yada. So unfortunately, I think you're going to have to see something like where Jordan showed a clear lack of awareness and pulls out onto the track and T-bones Levi type of situation. And then Levi breaks both his arms and he's out. Mm -hmm. And some just a total nightmare situation to where it's like, hey, we need to readdress what we're doing with these rider safety in order and to really change what we're doing. And how sad is that? That it has to go to such an extreme before we get a catalyst for change. Now, again, we realize we're in a very dangerous sport. We can't micromanage every possible scenario. But I like what Shane was saying. If you see a car out there and it's spewing oil or something's wrong for the safety and the sake of the race as an as an entirety, you pull that one person off. You're not picking on one person. It's for the integrity of the race itself and for the safety of all, uh, especially with something like that where, you know, it's not like we have lap times that are eight and a half minutes long. Within 40 seconds, you can be assessed, put back it. Or I don't know how long it would take to do the assessment. I'm not a medical professional, but I don't know. They're just, to me, that seemed like it could have been a lot worse and avoidable, which is kind of. But it was and therefore right. it's, right. it's not. Um... I guess spotlight it, right? Yeah. And that's why we're having this conversation. And I I agree with both of you, but I will make the point that in this situation, I don't really think anything was done wrong because of no. I agree. It it ended okay. It ended yeah. okay. And you either have to be so 
such a stickler on rules to basically say, if you get disconnected from your motorcycle, you cannot continue the race because every okay. situation is going to be different. Sure. And 100%. that, that would be the only solution to prevent something like this, but that's not going to happen anytime soon either. So I want to know what you guys think in the comments below. And we are at an hour and a half here and I have a little girl that just woke up. So I need to go be daddy daycare and do the responsible thing and not leave my kid in their crib for so long. So I appreciate every single one of you SOBs that have joined us in the live show. Make sure that you check out all these guys and their uh, links to their channels in the description below. It has been a wonderful conversation and make sure you tune in next week for yet another podcast where it is MX unfiltered. So Shane, can I get you to brop with me? 100%. Let's do it. All right, let's go. Let's just bang it. And then Johnny Z bike. Johnny Z bike. Dude, I freaking hate e bikes, but I love just the mechanical. You don't have to touch them. Don't have to touch them.